purpose of us of of us attending <laughs> um, that are not members of AFO. I think there are a few of you that are not members of AFO. I'm going to just introduce um, Association of Field Ornithologists to everybody. And um, then we're going to start with the, um, the talk that we have for today. Association of Field Ornithologists is a member-based organization that's dedicated to the study and conservation of birds and their natural habitats. And it serves as a bridge between the professional and amateur ornithologists. We have a strong focus in Latin America and we have some programs um, related to outreach grants and um, we support uh, people from Latin America coming to our scientific meetings as well. Um, if you become a member of AFO, uh, your membership supports a lot of things you have that uh, there, but I'm going to highlight a few, and these are AFO grant programs. We have the Bergstrom Awards, um, two competitions for the Bergstrom Awards. One is uh, US and Canada competition, and that the deadline for that is January 15th. And then we also have a Latin American competition um, the, the deadline is July 15th. Um, we also, um, with your membership, we also um, organize events at our annual conference and also throughout the year. We are excited to say that we're going to be um, organizing joint events with Wilson Ornithological uh, Society, um, quarterly events for students and early professionals, those are going to be only four members. We also published the Journal of Field Ornithology and we organize our annual conferences. And with your membership, you receive discount on banding and field supplies from our business, Avinet. Um, you have access to our journal, access to our grant programs, you have discounts on conference registration, and also you get assistance uh, with permits and animal care protocols through the Ornithological Council. And we are going to be celebrating our 100 years next year. So I want to invite you all to attend our conference. We are hoping that it will be an in-person conference, um, October 10 to the 13th of 2022 in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. And uh, the venue is going to be Hotel 1620. And we chose Massachusetts because AFO was founded in 1922 in Massachusetts. Um, so we just wanted to have a conference in our home state. And I realized that I, that I didn't even introduce myself, but I'm Valentina Ferretti. I'm the president of Association of Field Ornithologists. And I'm going to um, now introduce Patrick Keenan from Avinet, and he's going to uh, briefly speak about um, our business, Avinet Research Supplies. Thank you, Vale. Um, You're welcome. It's great to be here and I just um, wanted to use the quick opportunity to remind everyone that Avenet is here for you as AFO's um, research supply arm. Uh, we work globally to serve the needs of researchers with supplies such as mist nets, um, poles, banding equipment. We serve both bird and bat researchers. And um, I wanna remind everybody that many of the tools that we sell have come through the ingenuity of researchers and have been um, put to use or uh, marketed for purposes to serve other researchers. And I do wanna just make a quick note that um, Dan has been helpful to Avonet uh, in a couple of different ways. Today's speaker uses our products and um, that's something we take great <laughs> pride in, seeing the outcome of the tools being used and the equipment being used. Um, so please let us know uh, how you're uh, using our equipment through social media, posts to Twitter or Instagram. We are doing a little bit more of that and trying to connect in those, those forums. So thank you very much. And thanks, Vale. And thanks, everybody on AFO Council and all the guests today. Have, have fun. Thank you, Patrick. And I just want to say that Avinet is a sponsor for our cafes. And so um, we're really grateful for that too. Um, just a, a 
few things before we introduce the speakers. Uh, please, um, this is a meeting, so we can hear you if you're not muted. <laughs> so please uh, put your microphone on mute and turn off your camera while um, uh, Dan and Brooke are talking. And then at the end of the talk, you can turn on, on your cameras and uh, you can either raise your hands if you have a question or uh, type your question on the chat and we'll read your question and then um, we, we will have this question and answer session. If you're on YouTube, uh, you can also type your questions there and Rebecca Brasso will be reading your questions to uh, Dan and Brooke and uh, we'll, you'll get a chance to interact that way. And um, with that, uh, Rebecca, you might want to introduce Dan and Brooke. Okay. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Balasari and his student, Brooke, uh, who are going to be talking to us today about the effects of urbanization on Northern Cardinals. Uh, Dan is an assistant professor and provost teaching fellow at SUNY Oswego in upstate New York. And there he uh, is very involved in teaching as well as leading an incredible amount of undergraduate research, a lot of which he is going to be sharing with us today. Most of his research focuses on the evolution and behavior of birds. He received his BS from Syracuse University where he studied fish. Luckily, he saw the light and made the switch to birds shortly thereafter. Uh, he received his PhD from Cornell University studying Australian fairy wrens and did his postdoctoral research at University of Miami and Princeton University studying uh, vampire finches and phanopeplas. And so when he is not doing bird things, which I don't know when that is, uh, but he's usually playing with his five month old son and or watching the Red Sox. I am really excited to introduce Dan and Brooke and I can't wait to hear about La Vida Noca. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing and Dan, um, you can... Go ahead. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Vale. Um, thank you, Rebecca. And um, thank you everyone at AFO for putting on these, these cafes and for inviting me to talk to you all. I think these are really awesome. And it's one of the uh, sort of rare silver linings of all the pandemic craziness I think is um, the bird people embracing the, the online world and, you know, using it as an opportunity to, um, you know, do talks like this where we can reach uh, more people, uh, you know, and sometimes it's hard to get together in person. So as much as it sucks being stuck in Zoom, sometimes I'm, I'm happy to be here with all of you. So we are going to talk today about some of my research um, led by primarily by undergrads that work with me at SUNY Oswego on um, how urbanization affects Northern Cardinals. So does living in the city make Northern Cardinals change color? And then toward the end of the talk, um, one of my students, Brooke Goodman, is going to uh, take over and talk about her research on whether living in the city affects their uh, acoustic communication as well. Does it cause them to sing more or sing differently? So you'll hear from Brooke um, as well. And um, I need to shout out a couple of other undergrads who have been working with me this summer, Dennis Ramos and Shyla Luna. They collected a lot of the data that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, and so I'm really happy to be able to lead a, a primarily undergraduate uh, driven research program. And these guys do amazing work um, uh, with me, both in the field and analyzing data and working in the lab. They're, they're just stellar students. So I, I couldn't be happier to be working with them. So we're gonna start off by uh, sort of putting things in, in something of a, a dire context, right? Humans are ruining everything, okay? This is um, an unfortunate reality for wildlife. Humans are um, encroaching on wildlife uh, and, and negatively affecting wildlife populations in all sorts of ways, whether it's through direct exploitation and the pet trade or hunting uh, wildlife. Um, whether it's through uh, urbanization, encroaching on uh, natural habitat, 
agriculture, um, especially relevant to birds, right? Cityscapes um, with, with uh, anthropogenic light disrupting um, uh, avian navigation. And we can put some numbers on this, um, on the bird side of things. Most of you will be familiar with this a uh, relatively recent paper that estimates that we've lost about 3 billion individual birds um, in the last 40 years or so. And you can look at, you know, sort of different types of birds and see which are in um, particularly dire straits. And it's, it's not great news. Most of them um, are struggling. Interestingly, though, you know, uh, some of the groups of birds that are doing fairly well are the ones where there's been a lot of uh, conservation effort focused, like game birds and waterfowl. Um, so, so this paper is kind of interesting in showing us that we know conservation can work, um, despite a lot of the bad news uh, coming out of this paper that most birds are, are, um, you know, doing poorly. So I think everybody has this um, general sense that human activity in the Anthropocene through all sorts of um, different angles, um, climate change, obviously being sort of the um, umbrella to a lot of this, are negatively affecting wildlife populations. But I think a sort of less straightforward, a little bit of a less intuitive way to think about this is the fact that humans can also mess up how animals communicate. Okay, so we're not just directly negatively impacting populations by encroaching on their um, habitats and displacing them from uh, where they live, but messing with the ways that they talk to each other. And there's lots of cool research on this, not just in birds. Here's a really interesting um, piece of research on humpback whales, a lot of cool um, bioacoustic uh, work showing that whales are disrupted in their ability to communicate um, in uh, shipping channels, right? All the noise that um, big cargo ships uh, make out in the ocean can disrupt the acu acoustic communication of whales. And if you get back to our favorite critters, okay, birds, of course, um, this is a lovely study, an amazing study that the Dairy Berry Lab churned out um, during, during COVID time, um, looking at the effects of the COVID shutdown in the Bay Area on white crown sparrow communication. And it, and it turns out that these guys really rapidly adjust their singing behavior in response to the presence or absence of lots of traffic noise. So when the COVID shutdown was at its height, the traffic um, in the Bay Area was greatly reduced. These guys started singing more, they started singing differently, and so they're really affected by anthropogenic noise in their environment. So this is a question that I'm interested in, and my students and I study in northern cardinals. So we're interested in how urbanization affects the um, all sorts of aspects of northern cardinal uh, life history. But we're going to be talking about uh, communication primarily here. So most of you will be familiar with northern cardinals. Um, they're pretty widespread, especially across the southeastern and eastern United States. They're in the process of expanding uh, northward and westward. They're a dietary generalist. They eat all sorts of different things, um, insects, berries. They'll come to your bird feeder. And importantly, for this type of research, they love to get into human-dominated areas. They, they will readily breed in um, urban parks and people's backyards. They'll nest in ornamental shrubs, lilac bushes, multiflora rows, whatever. They don't care. Okay. So they seem to be one of these species that does fairly well in the face of human activity. But we still want to look at this question of um, how is urbanization uh, potentially affect, affecting their um, communication ability? both visual, which I'm going to talk about primarily, and then Brooke is going to tell you about um, acoustic uh, signaling or acoustic communication. So let's look at the visual side of things first, okay? Why do we think cardinals might be a good candidate for looking at this question? Well, it all comes down to carotenoids, okay? Carotenoids are these pigments that birds can put in their feathers and in some of their bare parts um, that they can't manufacture themselves. So they're not like melanins, for example, that the birds can physiologically produce. They have to come through the diet. And we know the reddish and orange color patches that cardinals have throughout their bodies are used as signals. There's lots of great, um, you know, decades and decades of great behavioral research on cardinals um, showing that their bills, their plumage color are used to communicate with each other. 
and some cool physiological research looking at um, feeding cardinals different things in captivity and also looking at these situations where you have these weird mutant cardinals that show up every now and then, these yellow cardinals. Uh, we know that the carotenoids that they're getting in their diet affect their, um, the variation in their color. And so they're potentially a good candidate to look at whether living in the city and potentially eating different things um, and getting different amounts or different types of carotenoids into their body can change the way that they look. And there has been a little bit of previous research on this that I'm sort of trying to build off of. So here's a cool study from 2010 that actually showed that urban males are less bright. Their red plumage is sort of dull. So on the x-axis here, we have urbanization. So out toward the right side of the graph are more urban birds. And actually toward the top of the graph are less bright birds. Um, and so you see this relationship where birds are found in more urban areas have their plumage, their beautiful red plumage dulled down a little bit. So this is the first um, hint that cardinal plumage can be affected by urbanization, presumably because they're eating different food in those urban um, areas. And interestingly, okay, this might have some consequences for their signaling. So this is a study by uh, Rodewald looking at on the top, the top figure here are uh, males and the bottom figure are females, different aspects of their color on the x-axis, brightness for the males and hue, which is the sort of redness um, for females in the bottom graph. And whether that has any influence on how many fledglings they produce, does it matter for fitness? And what they find is that for both males and females, in rural areas, it does, okay? The relationships are kind of complicated. They're not super intuitive, but it does matter what color you are that somehow ends up affecting how many offspring you produce. But because of the, the fact that urbanization seems to be disrupting their color a little bit, if you go and look at urban birds, that relationship disappears. So you no longer have any signal um, that is having a, an effect on fitness in urban birds because their natural color variation has been disrupted by whatever they're eating in these urban areas. So two studies here that sort of hint at the idea that urbanization can affect their color and it might have some important consequences for them. So I'm trying to build off of um, this type of research and ask just at a very basic level using some um, some different color uh, measuring techniques that I'll tell you about in a second. Can we detect in, in my populations of cardinals whether these urban and rural birds look any different? So where do we do this work? Rather than look along an urbanization gradient, I have two different sites that are drastically different in terms of their urbanization. So we're up in upstate New York here. Rice Creek Field Station is run by SUNY Oswego. We use this as our rural site. And then down in Syracuse, which is smack dab in the middle of New York State, there's a park in the middle of the city called Berry Park that we use as our urban site. And if you zoom out a little bit, you can see the drastic difference between these sites. So Rice Creek is really surrounded by a very rural, relatively undisturbed area. Berry Park is right in the middle of the city. So it's a good pair of um, study sites in which to ask this question. These are the types of data that we're going to collect to try and look at color variation. I'm going to show you some data related to four different color patches um, that we think are important for signaling. And we're going to look at males and females. One of the cool things about cardinals is the females um, have some really interesting color patches as well. So we're going to um, look at feather samples that we've collected from males from their back and from their chest. We're going to look at bill coloration in males and females. And then in the females only, if you open up a female cardinal's wing, you'll see this beautiful pinkish um, underwing color that we are going to look at in the females. And we're going to quantify color in a couple of different ways. So with the feather samples that we've collected, we're going to use reflectance spectrometry. And so this is sort of the most cutting edge way of quantifying um, color in a very objective way. It allows us to look at the full spectrum of color. We're ba basically blasting full spectrum light off of these feather samples and then measuring how much light is reflected at different wavelengths. This way we can look at ultraviolet, 
um, reflection, for example, which we know most birds are able to tune into. And then with these other color patches, we are um, looking at photographs. So standardized photographs that we take in the field with some color standards in the background. Um, these are for the bill and the underwing patches. These are really difficult to measure with a spec. Um, so we take photos instead to look at them. The disadvantage there is we lose the ability to look at ultraviolet uh, part of the spectrum. So we're only looking at the visible spectrum in those two patches, which is something to keep in mind. But for all these color patches, what we're doing is measuring the color and then also using some of the information that we have about how sensitive the avian visual system is to different types of light. And what we can do is produce some color variables that you may be familiar with. We're mainly gonna look at three things. Hue, which is really the color, right? Is it red or is it blue? That's what hue means. Chroma is sort of the purity of the color or like the saturation of the color. And then we're gonna look at brightness. Um, brightness is just how much light is reflected by the color. And so this allows us to look really objectively and not just say, ah, oh, to us it looks different, but how is it um, different as it's perceived by the avian visual system? Um, that's the, those are the data that we're going to look at here. So let's look at some data here. Let's see what is going on with these color patches. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that at a sort of broad scale, it looks like if we look at the back and the chest um, plumage patches on males, Rural and urban males are pretty darn similar. So first we're gonna look at the light that's reflected off of these patches. And if you're not used to looking at this, um, on the x-axis we have uh, uh, wavelengths of light. So, so shorter wavelengths are, are ultraviolet um, coloration, our blues and our greens. And as we get out to longer wavelengths, those are like oranges and reds. And on the y-axis is just how much light is reflected at those different wavelengths. And we're gonna look at four different um, patches here. We're going to look at chest and back in both rural and urban birds. And if you do that, you'll see the blue and the green curves here that go up a little bit higher. Those are chest um, coloration from rural and urban birds. The curves are right on top of each other. And similarly for back color, if we look at urban and rural birds, those curves are right on top of each other. And if we do this color modeling where we ask, okay, how are those curves perceived by the avian visual system? We can put these colors in what we call a tetrahedral color space. One of the cool things about the bird visual system you guys may or may not know is that they have four different cones in their eyes, um, one of which is sensitive to UV light. And so we can represent the space of all the different colors that these birds can see by a tetrahedron. And each of the vertices in the tetrahedron is a different um, cone that's sensitive to different wavelengths of light. So in this tetrahedron up the top here, we have ultraviolet, we have short, we have medium, and we have long wavelength. And this is where we're able to actually get some numbers that tell us something about the color. So the hue is really where are we in the color space, right? Are we purple? Are we green? Are we blue? The chroma is how far away are we from the center? The origin of this tetrahedron is no color. Um, and if we're, we're far away toward one of these points, we have high chroma, um, high saturation color. And then brightness is just how much light is reflected. Actually, it has nothing to do with color. Two different colors could have the same brightness. It's just how much light is reflected um, off of the um, plumage patch. So if we take our chest and our back um, colors and pop them into this color space, it kind of shows what we see um, with the uh, reflectance curves as well. The back um, color patches for rural and urban males is sort of the um, pink and the orange right on top of each other in the color space. Um, and the chest patches are similar. The, the blue and the green out here, sorry, um, the rural and urban uh, chest color patches right on top of each other as well. But I've got a little asterisk here because we have a, um, oh, I'll, I'll um, jump in the gun. I'll tell you about the asterisk uh, in a second. That's, we call that a tease in the biz. Um, first, we're going to look at these three color um, metrics that I uh, mentioned, right? Hue, chroma, and brightness, and sort of numerically, what do we see? And if we look at green and blue, again, our chest for rural and urban, and orange and pink, our back for rural and urban. 
And for hue, which is sort of what is the color, those boxes overlap, there's no difference. For chroma, how saturated are they? Again, those boxes really um, overlap, there's no significant difference. And same thing for brightness, okay? So these colors are indistinguishable. But there's a year effect in these data, okay? So we collected data in 2019 and 2020. And if we look at chest color, in 2019, we see this, this phenomenon that we saw when we looked at all the data combined. Um, the rural and urban birds, their chest patches have the same hue. They're both basically red, right? When they're in the color space here, they're red on top of each other. But in 2020, we actually detect a difference here. In the birds that we measured in 2020, the urban males had redder chest plumage. And you really got to squint at this to see this in the color space. But the um, rural and urban points start to separate in the color space. Um, and the urban birds get closer to what a red color is. And the rural birds are closer to what an orange color is. And this seems like a relatively small difference, but there's a statistically significant um, difference with a linear model here between these two birds. So these two groups of birds living in different areas. So these urban males, their chests are actually redder um, in this one year of data. What about if we look at bills? Now, if you recall, I told you when we're looking at um, bill and female underwing color, we're looking at photos now. So we've lost our ultraviolet sensitivity, which we don't actually think is a huge deal with these guys because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of ultraviolet um, reflectance. Most of their reflectance is in long wavelengths, oranges and reds. So now we have a triangular color space here. Okay, we've got short, medium and long wavelengths. And if we look at urban male bills compared to rural male bills, the urban birds have redder bills compared to the uh, rural males. And again, it's pretty subtle if you look at um, where these points fall on the color space, but the urban birds are closer to a pure red color and the rural birds are closer to an orange color. So there is a difference here. And if we look at hue, which is our measure of color, there's a, there's a statistically significant difference here uh, with the urban birds being more of a red color compared to the orangish uh, rural birds. Chroma and brightness of the bill of urban and rural males is indistinguishable. So it's really only the color itself that seems to be changing. It's becoming more red in urban birds. Um, what about if we look at females? The same thing in females, we don't detect any difference. So rural and urban females seem to have similar bill colors. Their, their um, color points in this triangular color space sit right on top of each other. And if we look at any of our three color metrics, there's no difference between um, rural and urban females. But there's still something interesting going on with females, okay? So that interesting underwing, pink underwing patch that females have, Rural and urban females don't look the same in that regard. So urban females actually have higher values for chroma. They have a more saturated sort of deeper pink color in that underwing patch compared to rural females. So rural females here are the brown points, urban are pink. And if you squint at this, you can see that the urban females are further away from that achromatic center of the color space. So the, the spot where there's no color, they have higher values for chroma. They're more saturated. So you can kind of think of it as like more of a pure kind of deep pink color. They're, they're further away from the origin. And if we look at the numbers and compare the two, we see a, st a statistically significant difference here in chroma. Um, nothing going on with hue and brightness. So that pink color, it's the same color, but it's purer. It's more saturated um, in the urban females. And there's no difference in the brightness of that underwing color. So there's some interesting things going on here. Um, there seem to be some, some sort of tantalizing hints that urbanization is affecting how these cardinals look. And we're assuming that this is happening through the diet. So urban birds may, for example, be eating, um, you know, bear, more berries from ornamental shrubs and bushes, things like honeysuckle, multiflora rose that sort of take over in urban areas. This is a little different from what the previous cardinal research has shown. If you remember back to that um, first uh, paper I showed you, the urban cardinals actually got duller plumage. 
in our data, we actually we don't see a, um, an effect on brightness per se, which that paper saw. Um, but when we look at uh, color, for example, we see redder color in these urban areas compared to um, rural areas, which is you know, not quite what some of these previous um, papers have seen. There's also some cool research on tits in Europe that um, also shows that urban birds are duller. The tits are yellow which is also carotenoids and their carotenoid plumage gets duller in the city. And again, that seems a little bit different from what we're seeing in the Cardinals, but there is some um, sort of anecdotal data mostly comes from banders and banding stations um, that some urban birds of different species do occasionally show up redder than they usually are. You might be familiar with this in waxwings, the waxy tips of waxwings sometimes turn orangish, reddish, more carotenoids possibly from urban areas. We also see it in flickers and we see it sometimes in orioles. This is a Baltimore oriole um, that has unusually high levels of carotenoids, which have turned it red. Um, so so there's, there's sort of um, results pointing in, in both directions in terms of how urbanization might affect the amount and the type of carotenoids that birds are getting into their body and how that affects their, their plumage. So um, this is, we're just sort of trying to build off of these studies and, and see how our work fits in with some of this previous research, of which there's not a ton. So where are we going from here? Um, you may have noticed some of these sample sizes, especially when you split into different years, get kind of small. So we're trying to, we're continually um, boosting up these sample sizes. We just wrapped up um, Brooke was out in the field this morning, um, um, wrapping up our, our field season. So we've got more feather samples and more photos to analyze to, to continue to look at these phenomena um, and see if they hold up with, uh, with a more robust data set. We also, with the help of some collaborators, are looking directly at the carotenoids that are in the feathers. Okay, so for example, are these redder urban males with these redder chest feathers, if you measure the carotenoids that are actually in those feathers, do they have more carotenoids? Do they have different types of carotenoids? And I'm also working with some people to um, try and look at what is there a difference between rural and urban birds and what they're eating? I'm sort of making that assumption, right, that this is being driven by the diet, um, but we can look at stable isotopes in the feathers. We can look at um, fecal samples to do DNA barcoding to look at prey items that are in, excuse me, the fecal samples of birds to actually figure out if these guys are eating different things, which we think that they are. So lots still to do. Um, so tune in, keep an eye on the uh, hashtag La Vida Noca. Uh, on Twitter and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll learn everything as it comes hot off the press. Okay, so that's what we know thus far about what's going on with visual um, signaling and how it's affected by urbanization and cardinals. I'm going to shut up for a bit and I'm going to flick it over to Brooke, who's going to tell you about her project and what she's learned thus far about um, the acoustic side of things and how acoustic signaling um, is affected by urbanization and cardinals. So Brooke, go ahead. Yeah, so um, my name is Brooke Goodman. I'm an undergrad at SVCO, and this is my second summer working with the Cardinal Project. And my specific project is regarding the acoustic signaling of the Northern Cardinals in the urban versus the rural field sites. So some things that we already know about cardinal song is that they like to sing between eight and 12 song types and their song is masked by anthropogenic noise. So they're competing with things like AC units and lawn mowers and even humans to have their songs heard in the urban soundscapes. And something we also know is that the frequency and length of Northern Cardinal song is positively correlated with urbanization. So these cardinals in the urban areas are singing longer and higher frequency songs. And so we know that they are adjusting their behavior for these urban areas. So what we're looking at is if the song repertoire size of the cardinals in the urban versus rural areas is different. And specifically, we're thinking that the um, urban cardinals are going to have long, uh, larger song repertoires because they need to be a little bit more behaviorally plastic and flexible to be able to be heard in this stressful environment. So 
Data collection has consisted of putting automated recording units or ARUs in a male's territory. So when we're not doing banding, we're doing nest searching and just observing cardinals. So after a while, we can get a good feel of where they like to sing. So I put up the ARU in hopefully the best spot to catch as much song as possible. And they'll go for five days for six hours each day, starting at sunrise. And over these two summers, we have recorded 31 rural males and 14 urban males and our pool of birds at the urban field site is just a little smaller but over the two summers we have re-recorded almost all of the 14 birds and so in the end this has come to about 1,560 recorded hours and in the bottom left is what we're uh, hoping to catch is um, a little spectrogram of cardinal song and on the left we've got the frequency and on the bottom we've got the seconds and so it would be pretty hard to go through, this is about 65 days worth of data and find these, um, all these four second moments of Cardinal Song. So I am really lucky to have access to a program called Kaleidoscope Pro. And what Kaleidoscope Pro allows me to do is I can give it a day of recording, so I can give it six hours and it'll give me back a lot of sound files, like 5,000 to 8,000 sound files for the day. And within those sound files, it'll cluster together similar sounds. So it'll give me about 40 clusters for the day. And those clusters can be a yellow warbler or a wood thrush or a morning dove. And hopefully in all the, those clusters, there'll be a couple clusters that are just cardinals. And I can go through those and just take down the different song types that are being sung by that male. And something interesting that I can also do with Kaleidoscope Pro is train it to recognize the individual song types and just cluster those together. So I have to create a classifier. So I give Kaleidoscope about five to 10 really solid examples of a certain song type. And I can do this for about 12 song types. And um, if I feed it another day of recording, it'll do its best to make clusters that are just song type one or song type two, and that can go hopefully up to 12 in an ideal world. And um, so that can make the um, large amount of data a lot more manageable. But what I have to do is determine what is a song, and if it is a song, uh, which song is it out of the repertoire that I'm trying to build. So I have to make sure that I'm not listening to a catbird or that I'm not listening to um, a male who isn't the one I'm recording, who's kind of snuck onto the territory for fun. And uh, I can do this by just knowing that if I hear a song that's only sung three times out of the four days, it's probably not the cardinal that I'm looking for. But if I am able to, to determine that it is the cardinal I'm looking for, uh, what song is it? So cardinals are prolific singers. They will sing for a very long time. So in that time that they're sitting and singing, they will mess with their songs a lot. So in the bottom left, I've got a picture of a really typical cardinal song. It has two trills, which is very common. And the first trill has got two syllables and the second has nine. And so I might see this song uh, sung all the time by one male, but I have to keep track of the number of syllables because if I see that 50% of the time he's singing trill two with six syllables and then the other 50% he's singing it with nine syllables, I need to consider if this is two different song types that he's intending to be, uh, you know, have different effects or he's just, this is not the same song. So I have to keep a close eye on that and they will mix it up a lot, but it'll also tell me that if 90% of the time it's sung with nine syllables and 10% of the time it's sung with some random amount of syllables. He's probably intending it to be heard with the nine syllables and something happened where, you know, he just had a little mess up and that's okay. So that's probably one of the more time intensive parts of the sound analysis is just making a really clear library of what the bird is intending to be singing. And so some pretty preliminary results. I've got one of the males at the urban site singing 12 song types and one of the rural males singing nine song types. And so that falls into the range that we're expecting of eight to 12, but that is uh, looking good for our hypothesis. But of course that's only two birds, so I can't stake too much on it. But one interesting thing that I learned while going through these song repertoires was that between the two field sites, they only shared two song types. Um, which was a lot lower than what we expected. So we're working with collabor collaborators in Florida who have been really helpful in teaching me like uh, how to use Kaleidoscope Pro. 
And when they sent me their example song library, the Cardinals in Florida sounded nothing like the Cardinals in New York. I like the song structure was even completely different. So I knew there might be slight differences, but I wasn't expecting such a low number of song types to be shared between field sites that are only about like 36 miles away. So that has been really interesting so far. And then for our future work, I'm hoping to create classifiers for each field site. Since there's such a big difference in the song types, I will have to create separate ones and probably create multiple. I'm hoping to build the individual song repertoires for all of the birds that we've recorded uh, and compare the anthropogenic noise between the two field sites using Kaleidoscope. And as kind of an end accumulation of all of the things, explore the relationship between the song repertoire size and fitness, because of course we're also nest searching for a lot of the day. So that is my project so far. Okay, thank you, Brooke, great job. Um, so, so Brooke is running this, um, this project looking at how urbanization affects cardinal singing. We've also got uh, a various other cardinal projects that are sort of focused around urban ecology. So trying to figure out um, other ways that these birds might be affected by urbanization. Uh, so one of my other uh, excellent students, Shyla, is looking at nest predation. So whether urban and rural cardinals put their nests in different locations, different heights, um, different levels of exposure, for example, and how that affects nest survival. Uh, we hope to look in the future at some more interesting behavioral things with some experiments to look at whether urban birds um, are, for example, bolder or um, less neophobic for, um, that, that might help explain why they're so adept at um, surviving and, and thriving in urban areas. And we're also working with some um, collaborators on a sort of different geographic scale to look across the range of cardinals at basically how different cardinals are across their range in their color and their uh, morphology um, and, and try and get some hints about what's going on as they expand their, their range steadily um, northward and westward. So that will basically do it for us for now. That's sort of an update on La Vida Noca. Um, and so uh, I, I need to thank again my uh, wonderful students. Um, in addition to Brooke, who you heard from, uh, Dennis and Shyla uh, also did a ton of work that's uh, represented here. And um, we got some funding from the college and from Rice Creek Associates to uh, do some of this work. And I uh, hope some of you have some questions and um, uh, maybe some ideas for uh, other ways uh, and directions we can take this research. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dan and Brooke. That was an amazing uh, talk and very clear. Thanks. Um, I think we have some questions. Um, but I will give people some time to type their questions in the chat and I will ask you first. <laughs> That's the convenient thing of being one of the moderators. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious whether you, are you, there are any indications on previous studies and whether you're thinking of doing any work related to variation in sexual selection mating system um, that might be related to these differences in coloration and maybe song as well. Yeah, Vale, we, we definitely want to do that. I mean, that's, I, I come from, you know, as you know, working like in Irby's lab, you know, looking at extra pair paternity and, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out, you know, how much sexual selection there is in these populations. It's a real pain to do that with cardinals because like over half of their nests get eaten. Um, so it's hard to get fitness data is, is what I'm finding. Um, but we do want to try and figure out a way to look at that, right? So um, are they occurring at like different densities? Is there more competition at one site versus the other? You know, is the strength of sexual selection different um, in the two different sites? Um, so that's in the cards, but it's, uh, it, it's proving a difficult question to, to get at with these guys because they're, um, they're, they're, very yummy to a lot of different things out in the field. Thank you. Um, so to the others, you can turn on your cameras if you want. I, I'll be reading the questions from the chat. 
But if anybody wants to um, ask their question directly, you can raise your hand and you can ask them directly. Um, Jen Smith, she asked, uh, do you think geographic variation in heavy metals in the environment could affect differences between studies? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jen. Um, I don't know. I need to, I need to brush up on that uh, research a little bit. I mean, I know there is some interesting stuff on um, like insectivorous birds, right. That are like taking, taking things right off the top of water um, that might really be, you know, immediately affected by heavy metals. Um, I'm not sure how much of an, an effect it would have on the uh, cardinals. Um, but there's, there's lots of possibilities. I mean, these guys definitely vary in color across their range. Um, and, and there's a lot of different, you know, reasons why that might be the case. And like pollutants like that, I think definitely could be one, but that's not something I've thought about. I'm gonna have to think about that more. Thank you. Um, Sylvia, do you want to ask uh, your question? Sure, thanks a lot. I've been studying cardinals in um, Madison, Wisconsin. I, I studied them for about six years in the 1980s, and I've gone back to compare their songs now and see how they've changed. And I, I'm really fascinated by what, what um, Brooke's doing. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm glad she's using the method she's using because you're finding out a lot of things. I, I in the populations I've been studying, different individual birds don't seem to have a lot of difference in the repertoire within a mile of each other. But the study I've been doing this summer, I go out to 50 miles north, south, east, and west, and there's a huge amount of variation, though, again, I have a ton of data to still to analyze. But I'm not surprised that you found um, low overlap at a distance of 36 miles. Um, as far as the the number of repeats of each syllable type in a song goes it usually in the cardinal populations i've studied the first syllable type is sung relatively few times but the number of repeats for the second one varies all over the place um more cardinals right now seem to have three parts songs in the Madison area. It was mostly two part songs in the 80s. I have no idea if that's just random variation because in Minnesota in the 80s, they were singing three part songs all over the place. And so, you know, the whole process of song learning and how it affects repertoires, there's a ton to be to be known about that. Um, I'm curious what um, what uh, acoustic recording unit have you been using? Because it, it looks like it's been doing a fantastic job of recording. It definitely has been doing a, um, a very good job. Um, it's from the Wildlife Acoustics. Um, mm -hmm. It's their mini automated recording unit. Um, Dr. Okay. Baldessari, if I'm thinking of that correctly, I think I am. Um, and yeah, we go for the five days, six hours each day. And I really have not uh, struggled to get ample uh, examples of each song type in that amount of time. So, but I've also noticed uh, in our area, they really stick to two trill songs very heavily. I can find really few examples of three trill songs. And I also have seen that that first syllable seems to be really consistent. And then towards the end, they kind of do whatever they want to do. Um, so mm -hmm. I've definitely noticed same thing in our field sites. Neat, fantastic. And it's really cool that you're getting it to sort the songs for you. That's just great. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. It's a lot. It's, it's wonderful work and I look forward to hearing what else you find. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to remind everyone, I think we can stop sharing. Uh, don't you want to stop sharing your screen so that um, people can turn on their cameras? And um, those of you who uh, wrote questions on the chat, if you want to read them or make um, the questions, ask the questions um, so that it's more of a conversation, that would be great. Otherwise I can read them too, but I think it, it's, um, it's great if you want to um, talk and participate. Um, so David Kerstetter asked, um, well, he said very cool work. Could ambient light also be a factor? Specifically, urban landscaping often has bright 
grass versus dark tree areas versus rural forest with a more diffuse light regime due to overhead branches. Again, nice work. <laughs> yeah, David, thank you for that. That's, um, that is something we want to look at to get the spec out in these um, different sites and, 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 and measure the uh, irradiance, the, you know, sort of measure the ambient light. Um, I, I have to dig through, the, you may know better than I do on whether, um, how much is out there in terms of like really quantifying light profiles in urban versus rural habitats. Like there, there's definitely interesting work that's been done on that. It's sort of like different forest strata and things like that, right? Um, these guys are, I, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see whether they're different. I mean, they're, they're in urban areas, but within the urban area, they're kind of in the same type of stuff that they would be in the rural area, right? There needs to be scrubby, you know, some, some stuff. Um, so to my eye, I wouldn't guess that the light environments are drastically different, but I, I guess I wouldn't stake my life on that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm here in South Florida, so we have very different light regimes than y'all do up in uh, northern New York. Um, but it's something that we face uh, looking at our kind of grassy urban areas and suburban areas around Fort Lauderdale, and then going into the scrub forests and uh, palm forests down here. So just something to suggest. Again, nice work, and thanks for including undergrads. Very nice touch. Thank you. Um, Sean, I see you. <laughs> Do you want to read your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, hey, Dan. Hey, Brooke. Nice talk. It's great to see your work. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about uh, molt. So I'm out west where we don't have a lot of cardinals, so I don't know their biology super well. Um, so I'm just curious if are they molting on the same grounds where you're sampling them? Because um, that would obviously affect, you know, color. Yeah, Sean, that's a great point. The, because the, you know, the, the, the feathers wear a little bit, right, which might affect the color. But in general, we're, we're assuming that the, the carotenoids that are in their feathers are sort of a snapshot of what they were eating at the time that they molted them, right? Um, so they're probably not really a geographic um, component. They're not moving, you know, very far at all, um, you know, in terms of dispersal but there might be like, there might be a phenology, um, you know, signal that I'm not thinking very clearly about and, and, you know, and that we need to think more about like sort of what is the vegetation and the available food like at the time that they're molting, um, you know, versus when we're looking at them and, and catching them in the, in the breeding season. Um, but yeah, to, but to more, you know, directly get at your question, the geographically they're I, we're pretty sure they're molting at the same place where we're catching them more or less these guys don't really go anywhere thank you uh peter wimberger uh do you want to read your question <laughs> sure. really fun talks dan and brooke thanks and as someone at an undergraduate institution. It's great to see undergraduate work incorporated in these things. So well done, Brooke, and cool work. Um, I had questions about the color. Um, I might have missed this because I came in late. So like, does testosterone, I mean, I think testosterone impact or it sometimes, right, is known to impact cardinal plumage. So do you know do you, are you measuring testosterone at all? Or do you know what's going on with hormones with these two populations? Yeah, thank you for that question, Peter. It's another really interesting facet of this. Um, and also like a tricky thing to get at because we want to know the, you know, the hormones at the time that they molted, which is not when we're catching them and taking samples and things. Right. So it, right. it makes things complicated. Um, we do have blood plasma samples, um, that, that we are interested in looking at mainly for stress hormones. We're interested in whether stress levels, um, or stress responses between urban and rural birds are different. Um, but, but looking at whether testosterone affects redness, um, which there is definitely, uh, 
literature out there to suggest that it may um, is interesting. But yeah, it's not really in the data set right now. Are they are cardinals? Can you net them pretty easily during non breeding season, like when they're molting, or not? Yeah, yeah, you can. People, that, I mean, Sylvia, you probably would know more about this than I would, but I know some of my cardinal collaborators really do that because they um, come to bird feeders, right? So you can you can put nets up at feeders. It's not what we do. We catch them just in the uh, in the breeding season. We target net them, you know, with playback and whatnot. Um, but I think you could catch them year round um, relatively easily. Um, and then I had another question, which was just whether or not there's Morrow's honeysuckle. If there's a, so Morrow's honeysuckle that introduced honeysuckle that causes that, that red orange difference in wax wings. I mean, have you noticed in the two sites, are there differences in the relative abundance of that? Yeah. Yep. That's another facet of this that we need to quantify, right? Because we're sort of kind of working off the assumption that it would be, have taken hold more in the sort of disturbed urban areas. Um, but it's actually all over the place. It's all, it's, it kind of is all over our rural site as well. And, um, but we haven't really done, you know, proper like veg sampling to try and figure that out. It might be something we can get at with our, uh, our fecal samples. Um, but really just like some proper veg, you know, sampling, uh, would help us figure that out. But, uh, if I had to guess, I bet it's, it's actually probably relatively similar. It's just, it's all kind of all over the place. Thanks. And great talks. Thank you. Uh, Rindy Anderson, you have a question. I don't know if you want to read it. <laughs> Sure. Um, so first of all, I'm not, I'm not Rindy. I'm Rindy's. Rindy, okay. your voice is so <laughs> deep. Yeah, I know. Well, um, I used her link for this, so I guess it automatically logged me in as her. So for now, I get to be Rindy. Um, <laughs> make her proud. Uh, I'm working on Cardinals down in South Florida. For those that don't know me, I've been speaking with Dan for a bit. Um, but I actually had a question for Brooke about the song analysis. Um, did you pick a magic cutoff number at which you said, okay, we have, you know, we, we've heard all the instances of each song in the repertoire that we're going to hear. He's gone through it and, you know, we can just say he now has 13 song types or 12 or eight or whatever. So at the moment, I've kind of been, as I'm doing analysis, I've been focusing on building the classifiers. So yeah. I'm like noting every single instance that it's saying throughout like the 8,000 sound files Kaleidoscope might give me. So I am not lacking in sound like I can get like hundreds of uh, the same song uh, throughout the five days. So at the moment, I haven't really focused on trying to find that kind of magic cutoff number where I decide that this is definitely part of the song repertoire. But in the future, in terms of time saving measures, um, I'm definitely hoping to kind of get a better idea of how many times will the bird sing this song before I can really say, OK, this is definitely in his repertoire. But in general, I'm kind of going off of the consistency throughout the days. So if I hear a song type that's sung like three times only on one day, I kind of, I take note of it, but I don't really include it in the song repertoire, but I'm definitely kind of just jumping into analysis. So I'll definitely have uh, more thoughts on that in the future. <laughs> yeah, if, I mean, keep an eye on that, that magic number, because that's something that is really big for people that don't use automated recorders or do and you know have ex like don't have access to something like kaleidoscope um that's something yeah. that my advisor used for sparrow research you know after 300 songs they've heard all of the song types in this repertoire but that's for something with you know immediate variety so they're they're flipping through from song type to song type they're not cardinals that just will sing the same one yep. for an hour and then <laughs> maybe consider changing and so that magic number changes dramatically based on the mechanics of when they're switching. And so us down in Florida are really interested in figuring out what that number is. So we can, we can do, you know, ask the same questions like you, is this linked to fitness? Is this linked to, you know, I'm working on microbiome stuff is this, and, and the brain is this linked to something that has to do with cognitive function. So if, if you know, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> If you know, let me know. Yeah, <laughs> we don't. We don't have undergrads like you that can uh, really work through this. Ours are not as uh, prolific. So, 
Yeah, yeah Brooke is Brooke's doing an amazing job churning through this, and I think she'll figure that out. But it is something that we've struggled with. That's like a um, uh, an artifact of the ARUs, in that there's some noise built into that data collection based on you know where you've placed them. Well, for sure. You know whether you've really placed them in a good spot or not. Are you on the edge of a territory? And um, there's some birds also, you just can't even you know record them with automated because they're too packed in with other neighbors around there. So there's some that we've tried to do that with. And I say, he's just not a good candidate for that. So. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So we definitely have some of that noise in the data set. So figuring out like that, that magic number is right. that's tricky. Looking forward to updates. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to remind those people that are um, on YouTube on our YouTube channel. If they have questions, um, you can type them on the chat or what, whatever that is on YouTube, and Rebecca will read those questions for you. Um, I've been looking at my phone to see if there are any questions. So if you see me, <laughs> just move my head. It's what I'm doing. But so far, there are no questions there. So we'll continue here. Um, Allison, you have a question. Yeah, my question was just about like age of the bird um, and if that could have any impact on color or I guess song. Um, and is this something that as you kind of build the study out for multiple years and have them banded, can you start looking at something like that? Yeah, we, that's a great question, Allison. We don't know, um, we don't know a ton about that in Cardinals per se. We do, we, we are starting to get some repeat samples um, for the color data set for males. Um, and I think Brooke alluded to the fact that we do have um, some longitudinal data for the repertoires as well. Cause I think, you know, one interesting thing to look at would be if males are adding, you know, increasing their repertoire as they get older and how they're doing that. Like sort of, you know, Sylvia alluded to this phenomenon that, you know, they, they might be adding more syllables on, you know, over time, whether that could even happen like on a, on a sort of developmental scale, you know, over the lifetime of the bird, um, that would be pretty cool to look at. So yeah, all of those, like those are, that's like my bread and butter, um, ideally is like having a nice, beautiful, long-term field site with lots of color banded birds that we can, you know, just sample birds over and over and try and figure those things out. And cardinals are pretty well suited for that. They're, you know, they're just easy enough to work with, um, you know, that you can, I think, can build up a population like that. So we're eager to try and look at some of those questions in, in more depth for sure. Thank you. Um, Laura H. I don't know if you are. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, you, earlier in the presentation, you showed an aerial view of both of the sites and what, um, what's the population of people at the urban site? Like, how did you, I guess, how did you choose that? Because um, it, it would be interesting to see I don't, I don't know how to word it. So, so what you would consider urban versus rural and how you chose that, I guess, is, is my question. Yeah, I don't, it's a great question, Laura. I don't really have like a brilliant, like insightful answer. It was mostly just logistics. Like that's the closest city to where we are. Um, so it's definitely more urban than our rural site, mm -hmm. but like, it's not super urban, you know, like Cardinals are right in downtown, you know, Miami, uh, you know, and that's like a lot more urban or, you know, Fort Lauderdale or whatever. Um, and just like the, the micro scale urbanization is probably very different in certain sites. Like some of the sites Morgan works at where they're just like, like a little postage stamp park, you know, in the middle of just like concrete, um, our urban site's not quite like that. I mean, it is surrounded by a city, but it's not a gigantic city. And, you know, there's some green patches throughout. Um, so that's one of the benefits of, 
uh, like what the Ohio, Ohio people um, do, them, some of those papers or did that I alluded to where they have a nice gradient. They really have like undisturbed areas right in the middle of Columbus and then sort of everything in between. Um, so there probably is, that probably is important like to look at like just how urban is it? Um, so your point's well taken for sure, but it's not variation that we really have in, in our data set, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It just it kind of reminds me, I moved from one state that's really densely populated to a state that is pretty rural, minus two cities that are pretty dense. And I do various field work um, sampling bird populations. And the town that I live in is 20,000 people. The nearest big city and big city is 400,000. But the town that I work the birds in is just over a thousand people. So it just would be interesting to see something where the state is much more rural and even your dense populations are still really small considering places like Chicago or Dallas or Los Angeles or whatever. So just curious. Thank you. Uh, Matt, you had a question, Matt Schumer. Um, no, it was just a quick comment on the discussion oh. about the, the variation in the light gradient um, in different environments. And I was just wondering if, if like a portable light box um, that you could use in the field to kind of control for the ambient light um, might be something that you, you could incorporate. Matt, do you mean like uh, when we're taking our photos of birds in the field? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, so we, we can control for that in our analyses by having color standards in the photos. Right. Gotcha. Right. So the ambient light is different on day to day or whether we're in the shade or whatever, but having standards in the photo, part of the photo analysis is standardizing the birds red versus that, you know, gotcha. red chip. Um, but it's still, it's still like, there's still noise in lots of noise, probably in those data. It's right. one of the reasons why like the specking is much more reliable because the conditions are so much more controlled. And even the people who do photo analysis um, like to do it under as controlled, you know, circumstances as possible. Like a lot of museum people do it and they have a nice big photo set up with, you know, full spectrum light and blah, blah, blah. Um, so doing like photo analysis in the field is tough and we, de we definitely make the assumption that there's some junk and some variability in that data set for sure. Well, thanks. Thank you. Um, Rindy, not Rindy, you had a comment, but I think it was, uh, from something before. I don't know if you want to mention that. Oh, no, I was just responding to something that Sylvia had said. Uh, oh, and then the capturing, yeah. Um, Dan, someone had asked about if you can capture them in the winter, and we randomly do. They, y you shoot for 10 males in a morning, and maybe four of them will come in full of piss and vinegar, but the others, it's like they've never heard song before. And they'll even sing for us in December, really soft and muted, but they still actually do it. So they're weird down here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Sylvia. Yeah, there's, um, so about the song, I know that Rindy's found that sometimes they're very local in which songs they respond to. So you might want to use even their neighbor's song, which will probably be weird in another way. I wouldn't do that for a study of song unless you were trying to study how they what, communicated with that neighbor, but um, that might make a difference. And um, about the song repertoire, so Cardinal's, often sing very short songs with just the first syllable type or the first in just a couple of a second. And then they might sing um, songs that have up to three syllable types, but usually only sing two of them. Um, but I haven't seen any changes over their lifetime and the evidence from people who've studied them in labs and looked at, you know, what happens if a new song comes into the neighborhood is that they aren't learning them beyond their first spring, males and females, Ayaku Yamaguchi found maybe even have a shorter period that they can learn new songs during. So that's more of a really long term change. And I'm curious about, you know, whether the kinds of changes I'm seeing have 
anything to do with adaptation to the anthropogenic noise in the background or whether they're favored for sexual selection or something else is going on or whether they're really random learning errors or things that come in from other populations sometimes. And I don't know any of that. I'm just doing the descriptive part at this point, but um, it's, it's lots of fun. There's a lot to find out and I'm glad you guys are looking at similar questions. And um, the other thing is when, so I've been driving around rural Wisconsin all summer looking for cardinals and when I can't find them, I go find a housing development. They're way more common in housing developments than in, in urban areas. So I'm, I'm a little curious about how, how much luck you've had finding them at your rural area. It seems like plenty, but I'm impressed. Yeah, Brooke, you've been chasing them around all summer. Do you have any thoughts on their sort of relative abundance at the two sites or, you know, what, are they more common at one or the other? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have uh, so many more birds at Rice Creek Field Station than at the urban site, but they are so much easier to keep track of at the urban site because they're so tightly packed in and they're so consistent with practically exact trees that they sing at. So, it's definitely not that there's uh, any more birds at the urban field site, but it's a lot easier to keep uh, tabs on them. And we can be in the rural field site and I'll be there all summer. I've been there for two summers and I'll find a bird in a spot that I swear I've never heard a bird in. And there's like three suddenly there like singing at each other. So there's a lot more uh, things to be thinking about at the rural field site. Mm -hmm. Harder to find. Yeah, and, Sylvia, that our, our rural site is good. There are cardinals in there, but the density is a lot lower. I mean, uh -huh. the, the, the urban site, they're just packed in right on top of each other. Um, and so I think they, yeah, they just, they're attracted to urban areas. You know, they probably like bird feeders and um, whatnot. And they, they just spread out um, a, a lot more. It would be really cool to do like some proper like territory size um, you know, um, types of analyses, because I expect it would be drastically different and like the overall densities would, would be different, I bet. At least at our two sites. Huh, it's because they, they live in bottomland, you know, river floodplains, um, naturally, when there aren't people around with feeders, is there a river running by your rural site? That could explain a lot too. Yeah, yep. I'm looking at, you know, hedgerows on the edges of cornfields, forget about it. They're not <laughs> going to be there. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Thanks. Thank you. And I think we have one last question, Jen. Thanks, Ale. Hey, Dan, great talk. Um, also, Brooke. Um, so as you know, we've spoken a bit about this already. I'm really interested in mechanisms driving the effects of urbanization on birds. And I'm slowly becoming a member of Team Northern Cardinal. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you know, as you know, I, <laughs> I haven't done much work on them yet, but my first field season will be next year. And as you know, I'm working a lot on backyard bird feeding. And so um, kind of, we've spoken a bit about this already, but I'm super interested in kind of learning more about um, what you're doing with backyard bird feeding and what you uh, expect um, backyard bird feeding to have an effect on, you know, carotenoid coloration and variation across cities. Um, and kind of to that effect, um, I'm interested to know kind of what bird food you're considering using, whether or not you think the type of bird food would have an effect um, and whether or not you think seasonality would have an effect on that. Um, kind of going back to when birds mole and um, kind of the different food resources they use over the years. Uh, and also, I think what would be really cool, and maybe we can start thinking about this as a, you know, as a collaborative team, um, who could consider lots of different people, uh, about I'm really keen to do a study, because, uh, you know, all my work, um, I'm working more in an urban setting um, at the moment and not really considering those kind of rural control well if you can call them control but in different experimental contexts about if you did these studies of backyard bird feeding in a control in a rural and urban area what might you think would happen to uh carotenoid coloration in those different sites um so yeah just kind of interested to think about those ideas and what you think and what you're doing 
Yeah, I think I think like bird feeders definitely you know sustain them in the winter. It's probably one of the big reasons why they, you know, I mean, how else is a freaking cardinal surviving in like Minnesota? You know, in in the winter, um, you know, ha having you know adapted in you know the southeastern United States. Um, so so you know, I think like looking at um, areas where maybe they're more dependent maybe on bird feeders and maybe they're eating more bird feeders and whether that, you know, has effects on coloration, um, I think would be really interesting. And, and it's definitely one of the things that might differ between the rural and the urban sites is that, that they would have more access to bird feeders. Um, but it could also be that the, you know, exotic vegetation is more, you know, obviously more developed in urban areas. And that's, you know, there's, there's sort of more literature about how that should affect carotenoids um, and the resulting color. But what exactly bird feed, like bird seed would do, you know, like millet and, you know, sunflower seeds and stuff, um, you know, having a diet, you know, really heavy in that, um, you know, what, how that would impact uh, carotenoid variation and color variation per se. Um, I'm not totally sure what I would expect. I, I think that would probably dull their coloration. That's what I would guess. Well, thank you, um, Brooke and Dan. You've done an amazing job and it was really interesting. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I will share my screen again. <laughs> to show you um, some information about our next cafe. Um, it's going to be on yellow cardinals in Argentina. Um, these are endangered birds and we are going to have Melina Tencio, Bettina Mahler and Alicia de la Colina give a talk on the conservation efforts of yellow cardinals in Argentina. And also, um, if you like our AFO uh, cafe logo, um, Matt posted a link to our bonfire um, store. We are selling t-shirts and mugs uh, to support, to do some fundraising to support our programs, AFO programs. So you can purchase a t-shirt or a mug there. And also if you enjoyed the AFO Cafe and you're not a member of AFO, maybe you want to become a member and support um, these types of events. So you can go to our website. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Dan and Brooke. It was a really interesting talk and thank you all that participated in the questions and answers. We think it was, it was great. Thanks. <laughs>